fabulous scholars. I am super excited because today is the last day of 1001 Arabian Nights. Today we're on the last chapter. We're going to see what happens. I'm so excited. I'm also a little terrified. So it's called The Night Empty of All Stories. And if you remember, Scheherazade had not come to tell any stories to King Shayar, and he had asked her sister, Dunyazad, to talk to her and say, where is your sister? Please come tell me a story, except he didn't say please. And Scheherazade sent back this message, tell the king I am not ill, but I will not come, nor will I tell him another story. King Shayar, terror of Sasan, towered over Dunyazad and said, Say to your sister, my queen, does she not know that I can kill her as I have killed a thousand wives before her if she refuses to obey me? On trembling legs, Dunyazad ran between the king and his queen, between the queen and her king. My sister, Queen Scheherazade, sends these words, I know full well that the king has power to kill me, but I will not come, nor will I tell him any more stories. The king let out a cry that shook the dome of his palace and the sky above it, and which shook the hearts of all those who heard it, particularly his old wazir and the wazir's little daughter, Dunyazad. For let it be known now, the king's heart ached at the thought of ending that season of his life spent in the shade of Scheherazade's stories. Tell her to prepare herself for the headsman, he shouted at Dunyazad. Then he shut himself in his room, and all night long his feet could be heard crushing the pile of the Turkish carpets and goatskin rugs. In the morning, all the flower patterns were worn from the woolen carpeting of his chamber. At first light, the royal headsman was sharpening his sword fever feverishly, for he had expected little of it for several hundred nights. The noise scratched its way up the palace wall and in at the chamber window, where it grated on the king's ears like a dog's claws scratching on marble. Indeed, all the cats of the palace were mewing. That's your cue, Maud. No. And all the dogs of the palace were whining and the palace goat would give no milk that morning. Mysteriously, Scheherazade had set her little sister Dunyazad to sleep outside the king's chamber door. And so it was she who received the message which the king sent in the morning to his wife of a thousand nights. Ask your sister, my dear wife, if she would be good enough to favor me with the light of her eyes and the sweetness of her voice at whatever time it pleases her to come but ask her that it should not be too long after the breathing of these words, for I miss her very much. Before the birds had cleared their throats to sing, Scheherazade stood on the threshold of her husband's bedroom. The sight of her dragged on the waters of Shire's heart as the moon drags tidily on the seven seas. Scheherazade, why did you defy me? Why did you tempt my temper? Why would you not come? And why will you not tell me any more stories? Oh, Shayar, said Scheherazade, I have emptied my mouth of all manners and all gentleness, and I have sent words to you saying, I will not come, nor will I tell you another story. For such insolence, that means rudeness, do I not deserve a sudden death and an unremembered grave? But the king held his head between his hands and let out a groan which shook the leaves of the trees outside the outer walls of Sasan. He fell to his knees and covered his head with his arms and wept pitifully. Scheherazade shut the chamber door and leaned over the king, stroking his hair. Oh, my lord, since your soul is in such distress, I see that I must tell you one more story. But let it be known that I will tell no more until the royal headsman has done his worst and returned home. There was once a king who was deceived by an evil woman and lost all his love for ladies. Now Allah, who had invented both man and woman, was sad to see such hatred for women in the fairest of his men. 
So he sent to the king a lady whose fate it was to love the king despite himself. Now Allah knew that in order for his magic to work on the king, he must send a lady who was in every way cunning. So he sent the daughter of the king's own wazir, and in order to save her life from the hostility of the king's anger, he gave her the art of storytelling. So night after night, she saved herself from a cruel death by telling stories which entwined the king in a web of wonderful words and held his hand from killing her. But alas for the wazir's daughter, when Allah came to fill her heart with the necessary love for the king, his hand slipped. He filled her from head to foot with so much love that it seemed her veins were full of sunshine and her ears were filled with the continual beating of her own heart. The king's heart was a caged thing, however, and the love of the wazir's daughter beat against the caged bars as weakly as the wings of a bird and could not force its way in. Despite the efforts of Allah, the king's heart remained hard and he loved only the stories he was told and not the mouth which shaped them. For that was how it seemed in the eyes and judgment of the wazir's daughter. One day, after a thousand nights, she found that she was expecting the king's baby, and the unborn child asked questions of the heart above it. Mother, what kind of man is my father? The queen's heart said to the unborn baby, the king is of a kind and gentle disposition, as you will see for yourself, if I live long enough for you to be born. It does not seem to me, said the unborn child to his mother's heart, that the king can be of a gentle and kind disposition, if my mother's life is at risk every day of the year. How can you prove to me that he will not hate me when I am born, as much as he hates you? Hush, my child, said the heart of the wazir's daughter. If I prove to you that the king is full of love, gentleness, and mercy, will you promise to be a kind prince, beautiful in life and limb, and a faithful believer all the days of your life? I will promise to be the fairest prince in all Sasan and in all the Saharan regions of the world, said the little baby. So the wazir's daughter laid aside all the cunning with which Allah had protected her, and in order to test the king's loving, kind, and merciful nature, she laid aside all good manners and sent word to the king, saying, I will not tell you any more stories. But it caused her great pain to behave so unfriendly towards her beloved husband. Now my husband, Shire, said Scheherazade in the king's ear. This story of mine will not be finished tomorrow night, or in two nights more, nor in two thousand and two nights, for it is the story of my love for you, which cannot be told in less than a lifetime. Then the king looked up at her and said, If I spare your life, you will always believe that I only did so because you are expecting our baby. No, Shalyar. For I beg you not to spare my life or the life of our baby unless you truly love and trust me. Then King Shayar loved Scheherazade more than Abu al-Hasan loved Pearl Harvest, more than Allah al-Din loved Badr al-Badur, more than Kamar al-Akmar loved Shams al-Nahar. Shayar sent for his wazir, the old man came into the bedchamber, bent almost double with sadness, for he was certain that at last the king's heart was set on beheading Scheherazade. But Shayar greeted his advisor with a thousand and one smiles and told him to hire immediately a hundred scribes whose pens could double the beauty of spoken words by fixing them to paper. The scribes were asked to write down all the stories Scheherazade had told in the thousand and one nights since her marriage. They were to be lit written in letters of berry ink on white stained gazelle vellum with fly leaves of snowy papyrus. The cover was to be of rich Morocco leather, inlaid with silken pictures and lettered with fused grains of whitest desert sand with the title, 1001 Arabian Nights. And so it was done.
copies were sent to all the libraries in the kingdom, but Shire kept the original manuscript in its priceless cover and placed it in a small cabinet of cedarwood and sandalwood in the bedchamber of the royal palace. The king's wazir lived to see his second daughter, Dunyazad, married to the king's brother, Shah Zaman, whom she made as happy as Scheherazade made Shire of Sasan. No small achievement, for Shire came to be called Shire, happiest of the happy, Shire, king of all joy. The prince of Sasan, when he was born, kept his promise by becoming the fairest face, the proudest prince, the sweetest son, and the most magnificent of men in all the seconds and centuries of Sasan's history. Nevertheless, Scheherazade always believed that there was no one lovelier in all of In, Sindh, China, the land of the two rivers, or the golden carpeted lands of the Sahara than her husband, Shayar. It is said that Scheherazade broke her promise to her husband and went back on her word. For sometimes, in the velvet-lined silence of the night, she could be heard telling more stories to her husband in the warm and loving bedchamber of the royal palace. The kingdoms of Samarkand, Alajan, and Sasan have long since been covered by the drifting sand of drifting time. History does not record what became of the wonderful manuscript entitled 1001 Arabian Nights and bound in rich Moroccan leather and inlaid with silken pictures and sand white lettering. Perhaps it was carried off by thieves, or maybe it was preserved by the prince's son, or was sold to merchants who carried it across weary landscapes and strange colored seas. Perhaps it fell into the hands of foreigners. I'll grant that it fell into the hands of one who values it for the scribe's craftsmanship and for the words between its rich covers, which tell the love story of Scheherazade and Shayar of Sasan. The end. <sighs> Find out what book we read next on Monday, scholars. See you then. Bye.